Welcome to the Vermont Dog Trainer Show. Here is your host, Ian Grant. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am super thrilled to finally uh, have this moment. I've got to say this is a podcast that's probably been a long time in the making. You probably know this guy if you're in the dog training world. I've got George Cockrell with me from uh, the Doggy Zone in Maryland. George has been training for over 40 years, probably longer than I've been alive. George, I am super thrilled to have you on the show, so welcome. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I haven't done these before. I did one with Chad a while back, but that was a live thing. So thanks yep. for having me. Sure. So, I, you know, we've spoken and known each other for a couple few years here, and I, I don't know if I ever truly, you know, learned the story of how you actually got started. What was that uh, day one like for you when you first got first started training? Well, I kind of got into it. Uh, I kind of was born into it. I uh, grew up... Uh, my father was uh, heavy into hunting dogs and uh, a few other dog things. So I was around dogs my I've been around dogs my whole life. Um, as far as starting it as a career, I kind of fell into it back in uh, 76, 77. I took a job, a part-time job at the a local college town here as an animal control warden. And uh, in my dealings with that, I had some dealings with a small, what would now be called a, a doggy daycare. Back then, they were just called kennels, a very small outfit. And uh, I had trained dogs. I had, you know, always ran with a German Shepherd I had. Uh, and uh, they asked if I'd be interested in maybe training some dogs there. And uh, I got into it and uh, I had my very first paid uh dog training class on Valentine's Day in 1977. It was Valentine's Day night. And uh, wow. I made all of, uh, I think I made $7.50 that night. <laughs> so, and it's been going on ever since. So, Was your dad a trainer or did, was you guys just had the hunting dogs? We had the hunting dogs, but there's a lot of training involved with that. And uh, there are always, uh, you know, a pack of beagles and pointers and things like that around the house. And, uh, you know, uh, the family, uh, his side of the family had a little farm. And uh, there were always dogs, you know, just surrounded by dogs hunting and otherwise just, you know, just grew up in it. Are we talking small groups of dogs or are these, you know, large groups of, of hunting dogs? Well, large groups, I mean... You know, it's all relative, but beagles, my dad was heavy into rabbit hunting, so there, you know, it would not be uncommon to see a dozen or more beagles around. And uh, um, one of my earlier memories, it was uh, it was back during the, the moon landing, and he handed me a runt uh, beagle out of the uh, out of the recent litter and uh, said, here, take care of him. I don't think he's going to make it. So I nursed him along for a while, and we finally lost him, but it really gave me uh, – I know why Dad did it now that I'm in my 50s, but, uh, you know, it gave me a lesson on uh, life and death and dogs, and, you know, uh, so that's one of my earlier memories of, uh, like, being responsible for a dog. I was, I don't know, nine years old, maybe. It was during – it was it's back when the, the astronauts were on the moon, so that was uh, – I would have been nine years old, so – so when you get out of high school, do you go right into full-time training, George, or are you going to college and studying something else? No, I graduated in 78. I was already working as the animal control warden and then uh, started training dogs officially then. I had trained several dogs before in my early teens for, you know, hunting type stuff, you know, alongside dad, but... uh and granddad, you know, all that stuff, uh, there were dogs everywhere, you know. So there's more dogs than humans in my life for a long time, so. It's funny you mentioned seeing something like a dog daycare back then. I mean, you can't go into any, you know, good-sized city without, see, you know, without having a doggy daycare there. What's what's kind of your thought on how that's evolved over the, the years that you've been training? A short word on that would be wow. Um, <laughs> there, were, there were none. None. Uh, when I started, 
I would say it has blown up. I'd say in the last 20 years, maybe. Uh, I'm I'm involved in a, a, a what's hopefully going to be a major one. Currently, I'm the training director of Doggy Zone. Uh, I won't give you numbers, but we're planning on being in the millions here very shortly. Um, nice. As far as sales, it's growing by leaps and bounds. We're going to be, you know, hopefully expanding sometime, and you know, got big plans for that. I actually closed my business down to go to work there. Uh, I believe in it that much. I'm still very, I'm, I'm in the, the training end of things, but uh, I'm around the daycare part of it, you know, constantly every day. So it's, uh, it's a huge business, and it should be run correctly, and that's what we're trying to do. We're doing some things other people aren't doing, and hopefully to make some of these things the norm, uh, we call our place a, uh, a training resort versus a doggy daycare. It's interesting, you know, from my perspective, I'm one of those trainers who, I mean, in the beginning, I wouldn't have even considered myself a trainer because I just did daycare and boarding. And even though I wasn't, you know, training one-on-one, obviously it felt like I kind of got my experience just by reading dogs and watching them interact and walking them and that type of thing. And I feel like that has helped me tremendously when it comes time to working with a dog one-on-one because I've seen those social situations for so long. Looking at maybe the opposite of that, George, of somebody that's done nothing but one-on-one training and then gets into the social aspect of things, do you think one way is better than the other? Well, I think your way should be every trainer's way, and it's been my way. I've uh, always been what I think is a keen observer of dogs and uh, Dad used to tell me I was half dog myself. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm, no, I can see stuff coming long time before it happens, um, and it just comes from years of really paying attention. Years ago, there was a feral pack uh, running around uh, near that uh, farm I mentioned earlier, and um, I spent a lot of time watching those dogs. They were they were neighborhood dogs that had gotten loose over the years, you know, hunting dogs lost and things like that, and uh, quite feral. But I used to watch, you know, them raiding and, uh, you know, like raiding for chickens and all kinds of stuff. And it was fascinating to watch how the dynamics changed depending upon the task they were up to. So, you know, I still observe dogs constantly. I probably observe them more than I actually train them, you know, before I start. You know, I don't just dive right in. I'm watching the dog. I have a good idea what he is before I ever throw a leash on You've mentioned me in the in the past that you did a, a number of years of observing wolves. Was it out in Yellowstone? I think you had said. No, it was. Um, we, it wasn't years. It was uh, actually several months. Uh, it was up in uh, Idaho and a couple other little places. I've owned seven over the years. You know, wolves and wolf dogs. Uh, I don't like using the word hybrid as much as some others do, but uh, I've had wolf dog crosses and. Uh, uh, you know, some full-blooded, and uh, they'll teach you all kinds of stuff about And this, It's not something I recommend. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> they would definitely, I tell people, you don't train them so much as you, you live with them. So, you know, you get in a relationship with them. So. Did you see a lot of similarities between that feral pack that you had around and the wolves that you observed? Yes and no. You know, the way I describe it, and listen, man, I'm no scientist or anything. I'm just a dog trainer that as opinions, but uh, I tell people that comparing wolves and dogs is similar to uh, comparing humans and chimpanzees, right? We have, like, a whole bunch of the same DNA, and even some of the some of the social stuff is, is similar, but when you get right down to it, it's a little, it's pretty different, too. So I really caution people about, I just had one come in this week that wanted me to work their wolf dog. Um, and I'm, I chase them away these days. I actually scrubbed the Internet several years ago. Um, I was really talking wolves a lot and helping people out. And what happened was I'd, I'd have a line of people with these wolf dogs with all kinds of issues coming at me so i made it go away and it actually cost me some dollars i had a company kind of hmm. scrub a lot of that stuff i still help somebody i think really needs help usually it's going to be another trainer that's got themselves into a wolf dog situation but uh i really don't even talk about it anymore because 
I got to be honest with you, man, it brings some of the crazies out. You know, beautiful animals, uh, great to learn from, but, man, they, I haven't seen one yet that made the ultimate pet, and I'm sure you'll get a few letters on that, but that's just my experience. Um, I'm sure other people do a lot better or something like that with them. I enjoyed them. Uh, beautiful. They were my friends. They're gone now, and I don't plan on getting any more. I have to tell you, I I think I, I had one dog come to me, and this was when I was running the business out of the house, and um, the dog had actually killed the chicken and eaten it. It was, a, it was literally, it looked like a blonde shepherd, but the face looked, I don't want to say wolf, because I feel like that's just, a, you know, like yeah. you said, a term, a term that's thrown around way too much. But at that time, I had my parents' chow mix. She's like, she was like 12 or 13 years old, didn't move around too well. But this dog walked in to my social group on leash, and it, it almost beelined on a very slow pace over to my parents' dog. And it just, as primal as I could picture, you know, paint a picture, this dog laid over on its back, tucked its tail till it was touching its belly, and completely mm-hmm. laid down in front of my parents' dog at that, at that point. And I had never seen, and I still haven't to this day, something so primal, almost so immediate of two dogs meeting before. Is that anything mm-hmm. that you've ever seen come across yeah. in your experience? Yeah, I've seen it a lot. Um, you've met me a couple times. I have a pretty strong what some people would call a presence and sure yeah dogs do that to me quite a bit upon meeting um i don't intimidate dogs i swear i don't uh but uh and i don't believe it's an intimidation thing i really think it's them turning themselves over here take me on yours for lack of better word i don't want any trouble right i'm not talking about dogs flipping on their back and peeing although that'll happen from time to time but (laughs) um if you really watch Dog body language is one of their primary ways of communicating. Uh, if you if you're still enough and wait enough, they'll show you what their intent is. And uh, so I'm sure that one was uh, a softer constitution, and just wanted to let the lady, old lady of the house there let her know she wasn't there to cause any trouble. But just remember this: I want to make sure this gets out there. It's my one of my old quotes: Nobody's ever interviewed a dog. I remember you talking, you know, we were sitting around the fire at, uh, at Scotty's workshop there last last fall, and I thought it was a good point where you brought it up where you felt like there's too much diagnosing going on or is there something along those lines. If that brought something to the forefront of me where, you know, every time a customer asks you something, why does this happen? I mean, we don't, as trainers, we don't necessarily have to have the answer every time. And it may not, you know, depending on our experience level, it may not be the right answer, too. You run into danger there, too. Um, I tell this to clients all the time and as many young trainers that will listen. If you run on what you think the dog is thinking, you're probably going to be wrong in the high 90 percentile. And if you're acting on a wrong bit of conjecture there, uh, you're slowing things down at best and hurting things at worst. So. I really believe in what I'm about to say. I look at what's going on in that moment. Another quote I like throwing out there is, dogs don't live in the past, nor do they plan for the future. So however they're being at a given moment in time is because of kind of what's going on at that moment in time in in their, you know, their state of mind or the situation they're in or that's what I, you know, I try to, I can be totally wrong, man. I'm not, I'm not an animal behaviorist. I had I didn't pay for college, you know, but uh, that's my thought and it's something I believe in and that's just the way I work. So, I, you know, when someone tells me a dog has been horribly abused and, you know, you get all these rescues in with all the stories that go with them, as a shock factor, I just ask the current owner, what's that got to do with the price of eggs? And it kind of slaps them in the face there. I don't think it's really, <laughs> you know. And they say, what do you mean? I said, well, one, this was all told to you, correct? They said, yeah. I said, so you weren't there. And uh, I said, so everybody puts a story on it. And what if we're wrong? It's just like when someone tries to tell me what a dog is thinking. And a lot of trainers will do this. They'll say, well, he's thinking this or she's thinking that. And I let them finish speaking. And I always just ask, how do you know? And I don't do that to be cocky. I, I do that to keep it real. <laughs> so, because uh, we don't know what they're thinking. Uh, but let me tell you, after all these years of doing this, what I am very good at is knowing what they'll probably do, you know, from looking at them right then and there. 
It keeps me from being bitten a lot. It keeps me from scaring a dog by moving in it the wrong way. You know what I mean? So yeah. I'm real good at that, but it's not from an interview point of view. It's, it's watching that eye contact, that body language, and in some cases even the inflection they're putting out of their voice. So, you know, you saw me work a few dogs uh, at that uh, seminar, and you saw I just kind of let them do their thing until I figure them out, and then we get to working together. Which makes sense. It gives you a feel for what they're going through, what you, what, you know, how you feel about them, and then you can work together. Yeah, and even then I'm wrong sometimes. You know, I go in a little too quick. Uh, everybody does, but uh, I'm more patient than most, and I can wait. I will wait, sometimes days or even weeks. I feel like sometimes there's too much pressure put on dog owners for making mistakes. And, you know, I've mm -hmm. I've uh, mentioned to, to, you know, some of our clients that I, I've made more mistakes with dog trainer or, or with dogs than you have, so it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just the nature of the beast. Yeah, it's funny you say that because I tell them I've made every mistake you're ever going to make. <laughs> and that's more. So anyway, but yeah, it's true. And owning those mistakes is where growth comes from, in my opinion. You know, sure. Um, sure. I know I've learned a whole lot of what not to do. He probably, if I had it on a scale, a heck of a lot more than I've learned what to do. So I know what to do too, but I know a lot more about what not to do with certain dogs and things like that. And then uh, when you get that right, sometimes it looks like magic. What do you feel, George, is one of the biggest mistakes you ever made with a dog? Maybe, you know, a, a, a severe bite that you got that you look back at and think, man, I shouldn't have done that. Well, I don't know if you ever saw the pictures that I posted on one of the Facebook pages, but I have a watch, a, uh, a heavy-duty Swiss Army stainless steel watch that a wolf bit through and broke my arm while I was simply putting a collar over his head. Uh, wow. That was the fastest and hard. I've been bitten, you know, a bunch over the years, you know, all these years and all those thousands of dogs. Uh, it's not a common thing, but, you know, it's just a sheer numbers game. But uh, that guy bit me so hard and so fast. Uh, he broke my arm, bit through the watch. I have a, I still own the watch. I have a picture of it where the, you can see where the tooth went through the face, through the back of the face, and then through the, the metal clasp on the back. Jeez. I'll just send you a picture sometime. I always, just a little brag, but uh, that happened about two in the afternoon. I was teaching my group class at six, so. <laughs> wow. Did, yeah, did you so, uh, did you know what happened when it happened? I mean, there must have been a, a moment there where you're probably trying to figure out what went wrong and then realize what happened. Yeah. You know what? I don't analyze it in that moment. Um, I have a lot of good instincts. Um, I got hold of the back of his head. He was pretty big, and I kept my arm in there so he couldn't, you know, tear me apart. I just literally held his, held my arm in his mouth until I could get a good hand on him. Uh, you know, I'm a big fella. Sure. And, uh, you know, I got him off of me and then, uh, I got the collar on him and then, uh, tied him off to the door, front doorknob of my house. I'm, and he's on the inside of my front door when this happened. Got cleaned up, wrapped up, got a lead on him and we get, we got to work and then I went to the hospital. You know, I got him kenneled up and, uh, you know, went to the hospital and got that taken care of. Biggest mistake on that day, I had had several wolves in the past, thought I knew what I thought I knew, and I didn't on that one. If it was a dog, I'd have seen it coming five minutes before. This guy, nope, nope. And uh, he just, uh, it was all defensive. I mean, we got to ended up being friends, but it was, I've never been bitten that hard. Uh, wow. I still wear the scars. I always say the scars on me are diplomas. They're, they're evidence of prior education. You know, that, I would say that's the biggest mistake, but I've made mistakes. I might have pushed a dog or two too hard, you know, and I always know I did it after I did it, and then I sit here and worry about it, and then you go back the next day and make it right. And that happens. We're only human when it comes to this kind of stuff. That's right. And like I said, I can't interview a man. I'm going on what I think I know, and every dog's different. Anybody that knows you knows that the Keeler method has been a strong influence on you. When was that first moment that you put your hands on the book? I put that's probably that's uh, the second book I ever purchased out of my own money. Uh, the first one I got an antique copy of Will Judy's Training the Dog. I think that was from the 30s. I still have it. I'm, I can't walk away from my phone to go get it, but uh, that was the first one. Dad gave me a bunch over the years. You know, dogs, I still have all these things. And when I started getting interested in the wolves in my mid-teens, 
you know, I got wolf books from the library, one of which I think is still overdue. I'm a reader. I'm a listener. I tried to, in my early career, I surrounded myself with people that knew a hell of a lot more than I do. Dad used to tell me, he said, uh, you know, it depends on who you're talking to, just exactly how smart you are in a given moment. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that the truth? So, yeah, so I got around those bird dog guys that were friends of my father's, and I was always Tommy Cockrell's boy, and then they started calling me Georgie, uh, Tommy's boy, and then I became, he's a trainer, and then they started send, sending dogs, you know? Wow. <laughs> Safe to say your father and his friends were your mentors in a way? Yeah, one of many. Um, it, that wasn't the only thing Dad did. He was a car guy. I'm a car guy. He mentored me there. Um, he was a hard guy. He was harder. I mean, he was a real hard guy. Um, but now that I'm older and brighter, and I know why he did it. And now I'm an old guy that's tough and well-rounded. Uh, he mentored me a, a bit on the dogs. I've been hunting and stuff, but I'm not uh, like a hunting nut. You know, but I love watching a bird dog work. So I got more into that, which I, sometimes I think was maybe a disappointment. But uh, And I know he wasn't that thrilled when uh, he died shortly after I started in the business for myself. And, uh, you know, I had to take a side trip there and uh, raise, a fa- raise the family. I don't think he believed in pet dogs as much as maybe I do. Did you have any dog training mentors, you know, somebody that was a professional at that time when you first got started that helped you out? Not when I first started. Back then, there wasn't all this communication that's available today. Um, I knew a few, none I would call mentors. I learned a heck of a lot what not to do. As far as naming mentors, I would say, in a weird way, almost every trainer that's out there that's been out there for 20 or 30 years, you know, I've learned from everybody, man. The one that impressed me the most, and I'm going to throw his name out here, and everybody should know him. If they don't, they should have, uh, is Cap Haggerty. He was uh, a very interesting fellow. I don't know if you ever had a chance to meet him. He's been gone for years now. But, no, uh, I haven't. I met Cap. I had known Cap via the early days of the Internet, you know, in the old uh, user groups and things. Finally got to meet him personally in 94. I had already been in it for a while. I was training at PetSmart back then and uh, doing a heck of a business for the PetSmart company, I won the PetSmart Associate of the Year. Like, of all the associates in the PetSmart Corporation, I won the whole the whole thing. And as a reward, they sent me to, paid my way to the APDT conference, the Association of Pet Dog Trainers Conference back then. And uh, I went there, not knowing what was really out there, but I went. I thought it was something cool. I was a member. Uh, I was treated extremely poorly there. Uh, I'm not blaming the APDT. It was not them per se. It was it was the attendants, you know, uh, sure. attendees. But I met some people that have become lifelong friends there that, that weekend, too, one of which was Captain Haggerty. Him and Martin Dealey. Martin Dealey treated me very nicely when I met him. And then Cap Haggerty and I, I went up and introduced myself, you know, starry-eyed and, uh, I didn't go work for Captain or anything like that, but I think he took a shine to me. He took a shine of the dog I had with me at the time. Over the next many years, uh, I really followed his lead and can't thank him enough. I'm still dear friends with his daughter, Babette. I'm looking at a picture of him right now here at my desk. He taught me a lot about how to be uh, what I – I don't want to say I'm a leader in the industry, man. That's big-headed. That's not what I'm talking about, but I – help. I, I give. I Hopefully somebody follows, you know, and learns from me, and that's what I'm all about, and that's what I got from him. And he told, you know, he taught me not to be afraid of it. Hmm. And um, so as far as, like, if I had to name one single person as a mentor, he was probably the most hit above anybody. I'm sure in your time you've seen a huge change in dog training technique. I mean, from where it was when you first started to where it is now. I mean, yeah. can you kind of can you kind of summarize what you feel you've seen change the most? What I've seen change the most is sheer numbers of trainers. Yeah. By I don't know a hundredfold anyway from when I started. Uh, you know, just the number of people out there that are now dog trainers. Before, it was club trainers, police dog trainers, uh, gun dog trainers, you know, a lot of specialty stuff. And then you had a few clubs out there, like obedience clubs. Now, 
everywhere I turn around, so there's a new dog trainer on the list, you know. So, and it's great. I think it's, I think it's great as long as they're what I consider really dog trainers and not posers. It's an easy game to get into and make yourself important at the cocktail parties, you know what I mean? I always have the coolest job, you know, when I'm at a party. I tell a really funny story. Uh, several years ago, I went and I do a lot of, uh, or I don't do it now, but I used to do a lot of school visits, you know, dog bite prevention, career day, that sort of thing. And at one career day, there was an astronaut there that had been up on a shuttle with some kid's uncle. Wow. And uh, we we're talking beforehand, you eating donuts and stuff. And uh, then they took us and took us to our various classrooms. And what they would do would be rotate us. So you do an hour and then go to the next classroom, and then he'd go into the classroom, you know what I mean, that sort of thing. Yeah. And then he comes afterwards, we're eating some more donuts. I like donuts. Um, he sits down, he says, uh, "He says, you know, I'm an astronaut. I said, yeah. I had had my Doberman there, Tempest, that day, and she was quite the performer. Anyway, he says, you know, I'm an astronaut. I said, yeah, yeah, you're an astronaut. I said, that's amazing. I said, that's just far out. I could sit here and talk to you for hours about that. He says, dude. He says, I had to go in after your dog. <laughs> and I said, yeah. I said, and he says, the kids talked about the dog my whole presentation. <laughs> so, and uh, <laughs> I always, you know, that was kind of a cute story. But, uh, you know, you always have to, you know, and a lot of trainers, I think, are, they use that. And it's uh, it's a great way to sound like an expert when maybe you're not. You know, if you just say you're a dog trainer, you're kind of an automatic expert or should be. I, I don't think that's a great thing. I don't like using the word posers, but there's some out there. Uh, then there's some real ones out there that you never hear from that are real, real good. They're not out there on that Internet. They're busy doing what they ought to be doing, which is training the dogs. So that's off to them. So It's interesting. I was talking with uh, my staff the other day, and we were talking about, you know, how many level or how many years of experience would you need to have to call yourself an expert? Because, you know, I've had people walk up and, and, or, you know, I might be doing a lesson with them and they'll say, well, you're the expert, you know, and and I'm like, that to me, that is a heavy, too much of a word for me to hear to describe for myself. I've got 11 years. I don't consider myself an expert. I mean, where in the grand scheme of things do you look at something like that, George? I like that question. First of all, you are an expert with 11 years. Experts say derivative of the word experience, is it not? It is. So you have 11 years more than somebody just starting the day. So, you know, and here's the way I was. You didn't just pop off and call yourself a dog trainer when I was starting. That would uh, it wasn't until some of those old dog people started saying that word in, in the same sentence as me that I thought that uh, maybe I am a dog trainer. I knew I could I could work, certainly run and work a dog, no doubt about it. But, uh, you know, and even today, as cocky and as old curmudgeon as this sounds, I think the old ones, the, the experts from before you should be the ones that kind of cast upon you that you're a trainer. You know, I know that's old-fashioned and, you know, think in terms of like an apprentice, like, you know what yeah. I mean? I mean, to me, with my level of experience, that, that that would be the ultimate compliment to me. You, you know, like that, you know, when somebody of your experience, 30 years or even 20 years, if they, to me, that would be like, okay, I feel like I've put myself on the map because I've gotten the respect of my, the, right. uh, of my, I don't want to say elders, but the the people that have come before me. Yeah, and that's that's where I'm coming from. And I know that probably doesn't fly in today's society, but I, I'm more old school than I am new school. While I certainly embrace the new in the dog training world, I like to make myself expert on everything, you know, doing the have to do with dog trainers. Uh, I'm very accomplished with just about any tool anybody can throw at me because sheer experience and experimentation and success and failure. I just feel that's the way it ought to be. And, again, no one has to agree with that. But when Cap Haggerty – let me tell you another little story about Cap Haggerty that, that uh, is probably the biggest compliment I got in my career, and I've gotten a bunch of compliments over, over the years. Cap Haggerty was watching me work this golden retriever I used to own named Tug down in Texas at one of the uh, conferences. He walks up to me, and Cap was a giant of a man. I'm big. I'm 6'2", 250, but he's, he's a big guy. He says, George, and he had this 
for the size of him, his voice didn't fit his uh, <laughs> fit his size, you know. And he says, Georgie, and, he, and he's one of the few people I'll let call Georgie without a fight. Call me Georgie. <laughs> but uh, he says, Georgie, he says, you have motion. And I said, what? Cap Haggerty was heavily involved in the martial arts. And he, and he tried to explain to me what I had with that dog. And I'm going to butcher it here, but essentially what this motion thing is, is action without thought. Uh You've done it so many times that you move without thought, you know, it's, uh, but it's more than that. He tried to explain it to me because he was into that, you know, that spiritual end of the martial arts and things. What a compliment coming from that man. I mean, mm. it was yeah. just, you know, I didn't, I didn't have to talk to that dog and I could make him do anything I wanted. And he'd do it. He sometimes without me thinking about it first. He just kind of would think what to do before I needed it. That comes with experience, man. I mean, you know, I was 25 years or more in at that time, um, which is a long time for anybody's career. And now I'm up in, uh, we just did, what, 41. Um, and I'm still going strong. You just get that. So you have 11 years. You're, you're a dog trainer. You no, know, well, there's not much more to say to that without getting into some transcendental stuff, which I'm it's not <laughs> the way. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. You've mentioned in the past during our casual conversations that you felt like there are just some dogs that are sociopaths. What does that look like? How Can you paint that picture of coming across a dog like that, what that moment feels and looks like? Yeah, if you let me explain my concept on what aggression is. Have at it. Okay. The way I explain aggression, first of all, if a client comes to me and says, my dog is aggressive, I stop them right there. I say, uh, the dog isn't aggressive. I said, the way you should be putting this to me is my dog acts aggressively when? And then mm. pick your situation. I don't think dogs, as a rule, are inherently aggressive. They're a lot like me. I'm the nicest guy in the world. I like everybody. Everybody's my friend until they decide they're not. Mess with my family, and you'll you'll see what aggression can look like. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I'm not. It's not my way. You right. That's. I would prefer not to, but I will certainly go there. Well, that's the way I feel dogs are, and when people come in with aggression cases, the way I explain it is this: aggression is a behavior, and in my opinion, most all behaviors uh, can be changed or altered. Uh, viciousness, on the other hand, what I, the term I use, viciousness, the dog that's going to bite you anyway, no matter what you do. Uh, hence the, for lack of better words, the sociopath. It has no inhibition at all. It doesn't even know. It's not like something he lived. It's something in his wiring. And, you know, you can train him up, make him do triple back flips. You can go get a CD on him. And they're still going to bite you on the way back to the car. Hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, yep. Just for lack of the old school term was mad dog me, you know. Now, let me tell you, I can count on two hands in all my career of that meant those type of dogs I've really seen. And they are best leaving this world, in my opinion, too. You know, a lot of trainers will say, I can fix them. I'll say, well, you know, go ahead. You, know? <laughs> uh, you see in the hospital. Uh, but I know that I've worked some really bad dogs in, the, in my years. and. Uh, some of them I don't think can be helped. Now, they might live a long, happy life in a junkyard, biting anything that walks in the gate. Fine, you know, but uh, they're not for the pet dog owner. You can't fix it. Now, somebody else will come right behind me and say they can, and I'm just, well, okay. I'm going to fight them on it. But yeah. uh, they're out there. But they're rare. Maybe less than 1%, <laughs> or maybe less than 10, 100%, you know. Which is a good thing that we don't see that many of them. <laughs> yeah. Recently, I, I read uh, one of your posts on a, a dog training Facebook page about there was a dog that I think your words were wanted to end your existence. Can you tell me more about that experience? Yeah, that one was kind of crazy. That just happened a couple weeks ago. I did an eval. We always eval the dogs before we bring them in. We have a conversation with the owner before we ever commit. It's free. It's, we don't have a conversation, see what their wants and needs are. And the dog was a big old, it's a big old, like an 18-month-old male intact corso. And while he was hard in the eval, he wasn't anything I didn't think I could handle. He postured a bit, but he didn't threaten or anything. He just, he was not a, he was not a dragon to be poked. We signed him up for a little 
package, you know. There was a lot of lies by omission in that eval, by the way. Oh. And uh, so when they came in for their first lesson, and listen, man, I, I if I take on a contract, man, I, I live up to it. But this one, 10 minutes in, I can't, you know, this dog wants to kill me. I mean, he's dead targeting me. Really? Um, I, yeah, I'm sitting down. The owner can barely hold on to him. I mean, this dog was... He's one of the psychopaths, but it's the first one I've seen in, you know, five years. And about 10 minutes into the uh, initial, you know, where I'm talking about what we're going to be doing today, I just stopped. And it's something I don't do. I just stopped and I said, uh, we're not going to do this. I said, I'm going to give you all your money back. I gave him a couple of names of people that might want to tangle with it. And uh, I sent them on their way. And then the post you read, I was talking about, I like teaching young trainers, you know. And I said, that dog scared me. And, yeah. you know, I think you know me well enough. I don't scare. But that, right. that whole scenario scared me. So I don't know if it was my inner mooshin or whatever you want to call it. Just saying, <laughs> nope. You got. I'm going to be 58 years old, man. Something really happens to me now. I can't feed my family. It could be a career ender, you know, and I just don't need it. I think that's important. I, I definitely got that coming from you at the, the workshop in the fall. And maybe this is a beginner dog trainer syndrome. Just mm-hmm. kind of feel like in order to get the respect of others or to get the attention or to feel successful that you have to work with aggressive dogs. And I don't know, that that talk that you gave kind of hit home to me. And once we got back here, we decided to, uh, we don't take human aggressive dogs anymore. And, uh, yeah. it, you know, when you put that into perspective of, you know, a good swift bite on the hand could end it and then you still got to feed your family. It hit home with me thinking that too. You know, there are some trainers that can do that kind of stuff that want to do it that, and and probably have the talent to do it. But you know, mm-hmm. I've got to keep not only myself safe but also my staff too. That's correct, and that's our policy at Doggy Zone now. Had that dog acted like that in the eval, it never would have been there for that first lesson, to be honest with you. But uh, like I said, I that was I can't remember the last time I told somebody I'm not going to help them bothered me and that's why I wrote that post. I wanted to hear I'll tell you to be honest with you what I needed to hear was all those people that, that know me and stuff that you know to tell me I made the right decision is what I <laughs> is what yeah. I wrote, you know? Yeah. Uh, because I was second guessing myself, which is an, another thing I'm not known for. But it bothered me enough to where I sat on it for a week and tried to analyze it and then you know I put it out there. There's only a couple Facebook pages that I really participate in. I'm a member of a bunch but most of them are silly at best, and uh, but that one I respect the trainers that are on there, and and they told me pretty much what I needed to hear anyway. I'm okay with it, you know. So the the flip side of that is, you know, that's one of your, I guess you could say, scarier moments being a dog trainer. What what is your happy place with a dog, George? Is it is it training one on one? Is it just hanging out with one? Where do you feel more at uh, home, at peace with a dog? What are you great doing? Question. I teach something that I call the our skill of being still. And it's literal, being completely still. I love being still and observing the world. And when I say still, I'm talking about I've been so still, I've had a chipmunk run up and sit in my lap and didn't realize I was there. Um, watching a dog, any dog really, participating in what he was bred to do brings true joy to me. Watching a hunting retriever do his thing, pure joy. Watching one of Donald McCaig's, who's another old friend, uh, his sheepdogs doing their thing, just brings me joy. Without, there's humans there, and they're, they're doing something they're taught to do, but it's when they're making their own decisions on that stuff. It's uh, it, it truly brings me peace uh, to see that. And I don't get to see it as often as I'd like because people get all kinds of dogs and inhibit their natural instincts for the rest of their life. But that's just watching a, a good dog, a well-bred dog, doing what he was bred to do is, you know, uh, just hard to describe. I could sit there and be still and watch it for days. So I, I have to say, I'm when I'm in a group of dogs, that's probably when I'm most at peace that was kind of the one moment when I, I lost my dog last uh, December. Right. Um, that was, you know, you got to have your moments and you got to grieve and you got to get through it. But getting back within a group of dogs, I, I, to me, felt more therapeutic than 
anything else. Yes, sir. I agree with that. Uh, as a matter of fact, when things go bad, I have I've given this advice to a lot of people. Uh, when things are at the worst in my life, I run to the dogs. You know what I mean? I'll dump myself into work, and that's all I do is, is train dogs. Uh, you know, I'll dump myself into work completely. I get to the dogs, and uh, that's where I'm at home. Like the old man said, I'm half dog myself. Sometimes I believe him. You know, you mentioned something a few minutes ago I'd, I'd like to address. Uh, you're talking about young trainers coming up and needing to work aggression. It's a phenomenon that's been going on since I can remember. It goes to ego, I think. At one of the very first uh, IECP conferences, I was advising some young trainer just starting out, and I showed him my arms. I had some scars. I've probably been bitten 200 times in my all these years, and it's really not bad. When, when you're looking at over 20,000 dogs, it's really a very small amount, and you're always going to make a mistake. This young guy, uh, just starting out, a tough guy, you know, wanted to work aggression, tell me how bad he was. He says, man, that's your fault. You know, he says, you've been bitten that many times, you must suck. Ooh. And I looked at him, I gave him one of old Uncle George looks, and I said, listen here. I said, yeah, I've been bitten a couple of hundred times. I said, but boy, I ain't never been bit by the same dog twice. Mm. But that would be a very common response. Those scars, I ain't proud of them. But if I can keep you from getting bitten a bunch, I'm going to give you that advice whether you want it or not. To those young trainers that think they need to tell me how tough every dog is, I, first of all, I know there's not that many tough dogs out there, real ones. I've seen the real ones. There's yeah. some trainers out there that will tell you they're carrying aggression in their 10-day remote collar program, and, you know, they'll show a video before and after. Yeah, okay, whatever you say. Um, <laughs> I could show them a dog they couldn't get that remote collar on on a bed. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I I tell young trainers this, don't follow false gods. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because, yep. yeah, the dog might be reactive. i got 10 dogs a day come see me that blow up at other dogs. They're not aggressive. They're not they're not dangerous. They're just loud mouths and need to be taught another alternative. That's all. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So think, that's my you know, advice to anybody that wants to listen. It hit me probably about... I don't know, four or five years ago where I it, I was just, I kind of got over it. But then I looked at, I don't know, maybe looking within where I felt prouder helping a dog that was scared, nervous, skittish, timid. When I see that dog come out of that shell, that's a much more pleasing moment for me. And a much more, I feel more successful as a dog trainer then than if I do taking a dog that's aggressive or what, I mean, <laughs> my term of aggressive, <laughs> you know, and having that stop as a behavior, you know, showing those aggressive tendencies. So I don't know yeah. if I get a, I get a scared or nervous dog that comes in and I, I feel like, oh boy, I get, a, I get to help another one. Hey man, you, you, that's the right way to look at it. You know, I don't know if it's my age, my mellow or my wisdom, but man, I like them little puppies coming in these days. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'd do all puppies if the market was there. I swear I would. But uh, that's what it is. You don't have to. Here's something for you. Everybody talks about that, you know, that mythical alpha dude. Here's the deal. The alpha doesn't do all that yelling, carrying on, disciplining, and dominating. I've seen the real deal doing what they really do. What they do is they control the mood of the moment, man. A real alpha is going to look at that dog and shut it down versus flip him on his back, et cetera, and everything else that people do. Right. You know, you know what I'm saying? So, um, think about this. If you have to tell, prove a dog that you're the boss or the alpha or the leader or whatever, pack leader, whatever term you want to use, if you have to tell them that, consider this. You've already entered negotiations, and a real leader don't negotiate. Hmm. And I feel like that word dominant is thrown around way, way, way too much, too. It is. I firmly believe that I haven't seen a truly dominant dog walk into any social group that I've ever had here. I mean, I, I I feel like if that truly dominant dog walked in, it would part the sea. Everybody would chill out. You know, there'd be a drastic, there'd be a drastic change in that whole dynamic. And I just, yeah. I have yet to see that. Yeah. You know, it's, I do for fun at the day camp or at the daycare. I'll walk into one of the playrooms when they're being a little obnoxious. I just walk in there and they all seem to shut up and look. 
<laughs> um, but uh, let me tell you something about dominance. Again, this is what my opinion. Anybody can argue with it if they want. For you to be dominated, you have to allow that to occur. Yeah. I can't come in here and dominate you if you choose not to take it. Think about that. Yeah, it's deep. It is. You think about it. You can't dominate me. Nobody can dominate me. Oh, they can beat the snot out of me. They can beat me. But until my will says, I'll follow you, you ain't dominant. Again, I just feel like that word is thrown around so much that that it's almost lost its actual meaning to it. Well, think about You know, you're on the Internet quite a bit. Listen to the the old buzzards that are out there, people that have been around as long as me. And you know what I'm talking about, Mark and Linda and a bunch of others. Cindy down in Georgia. It's funny, you never see those words on our posts. No. You don't see aggression a lot either, do you? No. The more you know, the less you need to use the verbiage, man. A lot of terms like dominance and, you know, even aggression and alpha and all this other stuff, man, they're terms meant to grab attention. And alpha don't need attention. Where do you see the future of dog training going, George? You ever thought about that? Yeah. Think about it a lot. Hopefully, I'm going to be gone when it gets there. But, uh, <laughs> you know, listen, and, you know, I I will work with a remote collar. I will work with a clicker. I work with stuff you've never even seen. We well, have seen some of it at the seminars. But uh, these people that are advocating the remotes constantly in this fast, fast uh, cures, and they're not cures. They're improvements. They're not cures. They're making it harder on themselves by being so vocal and so argumentative against, you know, people that aren't necessarily advocates of that tool in particular, or prong collars, or any tool, man. Everybody's got an opinion on a tool. And, you know, my quote is, it's not the tool, it's the fool. Be expert yeah. in everything. I never have to turn a customer away because they don't want to use a particular tool. But what's going to happen is, it's coming. You can already see it. it they're going to regulate. And uh, everybody gets in a real uproar. Like when I think up there in Canada, they regulated collars or something recently. And everybody lost their mind. I was talking to my team, and I said, uh, get ready. And they said, for what? I said, well, they're going to ban the e-collars up in, in Canada and stuff. I said, be ready. And they're like, for what? I said, more business. <laughs> because we're not going to miss a beat because we can use it all. I don't need a remote collar or a palm collar. And I use these to understand. Folks listening, I'm not telling you they ain't good tools. I love them, but I don't have to have them. I make sure the trainers that come up under me could take a ball, uh, a length of twine, maybe a pocket full of cookies or a ball, and make something good happen with the dog. And I think every trainer should have that level of skill. There, I said it. <laughs> Put it in stone. But in, I said it. You know, I'll, I'll back <laughs> it up. I mean, listen, I'm not anti any tool, brother. You know, so don't. I hope nobody comes after you like that. Not that at all. I just saying. Here, I'll say it, and Uncle George speak. Shut up and train the dogs, man. You know, stop pulling this stuff down onto this combat down on top of you. I know you uh, listen to some of these episodes, so you're you're probably going to see this. Uh, you may see this question coming, but now we're talking tools and trainers. What is your definition of a dog trainer, George? Uh, <laughs> let's <laughs> see. Okay. A trainer can, a good dog trainer, first of all, let me tell you what my definition of a trained dog is. This one always brings a few laughs. A trained dog is a dog that does what he's been taught to do when he's supposed to do it. Even if you only train him to do one thing, he's trained to sit. Okay, well, that's a trained dog. He's trained to sit. He can probably use some more skills, but he's trained to sit, so that's trained. And unfortunately, a lot of trainers have the low standards, and that's all they teach. But uh, anyway. Your dog trainer, let's define dog trainer between professional and amateur and hobby. A professional earns his or her pay producing positive, reliable, repeatable results for the owner and dog at hand and should collect a fee for such. Okay? Fair enough. All right. The trainer that's just learning, which there's nothing wrong with, you know me, I want to teach them all. I wish they'd all come to me. And by the way, I'm looking for help. So, anyways, <laughs> if I know anybody, <laughs> yeah, if you know anybody, there it is. I put it out there on the podcast. But uh, <laughs> anyway, while you're learning, if you don't have the skills to reliably reproduce with somebody else's dog, what they're paying you for, repeatable, customer after customer, 
then I don't think you should be collecting money for it yet. To the hobbyist, continue on. You will get there if that's what you want. Yeah, I don't feel like, for instance, if a trainer's training for, uh, oh, uh, let's say AKC obedience, just for something to drop off the wall there, you know, and they haven't at least CDX the dog. I don't think you should be charging people money. They haven't done it themselves. That makes sense to me, but I know there's plenty out there doing that. Uh, same goes with the people that are training people for agility competition. That old saying that those that can do and those that can't teach, I think, is a real cop-out. I don't believe in it at all. I believe you can teach them stuff, but I don't think you should be charging money for it unless you've done it. That's just, again, my opinion, George's opinion, not Ian's. <laughs> so, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, that's my – and if you go back to my old dog ways – why don't you wait till an old dog trainer tells you you're a dog trainer? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you know, but uh, you don't have to do that. That's just me. You know, I brought Jess up. You know, is my she's the one I'm leaving all this to. She's a dog trainer. I'll call her one, and she can out train a lot of people I know. You know, so she's earned that, and not just because I said so. She can prove it day in and day out, and she does. So that's what I'm talking about. She's a dog trainer. But she doesn't she doesn't sell AKC obedience competition because she hasn't done it. She's working on Raven. I've let her use Raven to get Raven ready to compete and then when she does that, then she can sell that. She went through the Keeler course with Tony Anchetta. Uh, hi Tony, I hope you're listening. <laughs> um so now after that I've allowed her to start, you know, if she wants to teach the uh, Keeler based a series of sessions, uh she's welcome to and we charge for it. Before, she, I wouldn't let her do that. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. My definition of dog trainer is there. I mean, it's arrogant for me to say, who says I'm a dog trainer? You know what I mean? If you're not recognized as your, from your peers, and I mean respectfully recognized, then are you really a dog trainer? Say who tells you, the dog in front of you. Isn't that the truth? Yes, sir. The dog will tell you if you're getting it done or not. They don't lie. And they don't boost egos either. If anything else, they try to shoot holes in it. <laughs> <laughs> they so. get uh, very humbling sometimes. Yeah, as it should be. They, yeah. We all get big-headed. I'm as arrogant as they come at sometimes. I get it. At least I own it. <laughs> What's your proudest moment uh, in this illustrious 41-year career, George? Proudest moment. It's a crazy moment, but... I think the pro I, I've mentioned this dog Tug. He was, you know, everybody has that heart dog, that one in a million. Yeah. Well, that was that was big Tug. I was doing a seminar years and years and years ago up at uh, Jean Perchicante, her uh, place in New Jersey. Big Tug was a great big golden big man dog, you know, big muscles and just gorgeous, dark red. He was laying at uh, underneath a table while I was doing the seminar. He'd been laying under there an hour or two. One of the attendees had a punk dog, and it, it charged a puppy during the seminar right in the middle of me talking. And before I even kind of looked over, Hug had left his position and, I mean, smoked this dog. <laughs> okay? And, I mean, he took this dog out, and I just whistled. I mean, it was, it was like it was surreal because I just whistled and went out, and he just returned to heel. There was wow. probably 50 witnesses to that, and uh, he saved that little puppy's life, in my opinion. So, wow. I think that was my proudest one. That was uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, he was disobedient to me uh, in that I had told him to stay an hour or two before. Sure, but uh, he made the right decision. And uh, I got news for you. Had I seen it coming earlier, I might have told him free. You know, I can't tell you I wouldn't have. But uh, right, but he he broke up that dog fight. And uh, that was very proud for me, especially because he outed in, out of the middle of a dog fight. It was beautiful. That's intense, That's yeah. Proud. And then that day, Cap Haggerty, he told me what he told me. There's actually a photograph of him and Tug that day. Uh, it's been on, you know, around the Internet uh, of him and that dog. That day, he told me I had motion. So that, that was a very proud moment. There's been a bunch of them, man. When back during we when I was competing with Tug, he he couldn't be beat. Some you know what I mean? It was just I think that I'll tell you what my proudest thing is. I've gotten a lot of dog trainers started over the year years, gave them a helping hand along the way, 
and they're still in business. That's my proudest day. Wow, nice. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, yep. That's it. The people I've helped that are still out there, the people I've given advice to, and they took it and thanked me for it and are still out there, and some of them are people you've heard of, brother. That's my proudest day. That's what I'll tell you. So give us an update on uh, Little Buckshot. Oh, my God. <laughs> that little hat-eating son of a mother. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He's doing extremely well. You know, he's got that Facebook page, Buckshot the Wonder Dog on Facebook. Go over yep. there and check him out. Well, I wear hats all the time, and uh, sometimes I doze. <laughs> and uh, he's, he's gotten four hats of mine to date. And he, what he does, you know the little uh, the little button on top of a, of a hat, you know, a small cap? Sure. He pops that button off and chews the left front corner of the bill just enough where I can't wear it no more. Uh. <laughs> and uh, listen, man, I'm a pro dog trainer, and it goes to show you that even we have these issues. It's the only thing that little dog does wrong. Uh, you know what I'm saying? And uh, he got one the other night, and he's still in the dog house. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a cute little bugger. You know, we lost Gunner quite suddenly uh, yeah. over a year ago. Yep. And I, I said, I'm going to take a day off from having a new dog and a new male dog in the house. And, uh, yeah, that lasted until we saw them little rescues up in New Jersey on the Facebook. So we went and got one. I love the little dogs. I love my big dogs. I have the Doberman. But uh, the little dog, he tickles me to death. He's some little dog. So I suggest everybody go watch Buckshot the Wonder Dog. It's some fun stuff, uh, you know, watching the training sessions and kind of your watching him growing up before our eyes. <laughs> yeah, he's nine months old today, as a matter of fact. Wow. So wow. yeah, we're enjoying we're enjoying him. He's uh, he's good for Brad, little Bradley. You know, it was a shock for Bradley. He's seven years old, and then we lost Gunner, who had become his best friend, and um, uh, that one broke my heart. It was so sudden. Uh, but uh, when you get a dog, when you get involved in dogs, listen to this, everybody. You're doomed to heartbreak. Yeah. That's fact. And yeah, so. There's a lot of people that may or may not know that I lost uh, my dog, Lula. I think it was last December. And yeah. that was kind of my Lula. my dog that uh, got me going. And uh -huh. I have to say publicly, George, that you, you helped me probably more than you can imagine during that whole time. So I, I definitely wanted to, to thank you very much for your advice and your wisdom during that whole time. Well, I'm glad I could help. That's that's what that's what moves me. That's my uh, motivating thing. Here's another little something for you. You know, dogs. No matter what they do in this world, if you think about it, you start boiling things down, which is something I'm good at. I boil things down to the very, you know, to what I call the awesome sauce. Everything your dog does, he's trying to acquire or maintain only two things: what he needs or what he wants. Okay. So what yeah. he does, he's trying to get what he needs and what he wants. My motivating force, if you will, what I want is to make sure that all the blessings I've had in this business is passed along the best way I can do it. That's that's my awesome sauce there. That's where it all comes from for me. I want to give this all away, right, wrong, or indifferent. I want to give it away and make sure somebody's got it for when I go. That's what somebody did it for me in the past, and so that's what I want to do. So that's why I wanted to bring that up. Yeah, I was doing that for me as much as you because I want to give it to you, you know? Yep, and I, I appreciate it. It it, it helped mm -hmm. a ton, that's for sure. Well, good. I'm glad. So let's uh, wrap this up with the breed game. I think you're probably very aware of this. Yeah, I've listened to every episode, every single one. <laughs> All right, you ready? Yeah. Uh, German Shepherd. Beginnings. Beagle. Music. Music? Why music? When a beagle bays, man, it's music to my ears. Ah, gotcha. Uh-huh. Golden Retriever? Tug. <laughs> uh -huh. Yellow Lab? Big Gunner. Two words, but one one, one word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Doberman? Both the ones I had, I'm going to give you one word. Psycho. Really? <laughs> oh, I, I got I got them on purpose because they were quote unquote broken. But oh man, I love them. I I think I'm a Doberman guy now more so than the Gun Dogs. I really believe that. Like if when if you know we decide to uh, 
get another, it will most likely be a Doberman. I've fallen completely in love with the breed over the last, uh, yeah, I guess it's 20 years now I've had them. So, what is it that you enjoy about them so much? Their brilliance, their problem-solving capabilities. Um, the, the two I got were aggression cases. Uh, one, the, early, the first one was uh, Tempest. She had chewed on a few Montgomery County police officers and was due for euthanasia. She belonged to an officer, and she at a, at a barbecue at this officer's house, she real bad uh, attack. He had hired me to help him, but before I could get over there to do the work, this happened. And then the uh, the uh, DC sniper start that was going on right then. That's wow. right when that job would have taken place, and he was on the job for that, so we couldn't get together. And then he called me and said, George, he says, uh, I've got to get rid of her. Um, he said, uh, I got in a little trouble, you know, and told me what had happened. He says, you're the only guy I've ever met that, that she responded to. And I said, uh, I'll be over in 10 minutes. And uh, he gave me to her. And then wow. I, uh, this is a great story about her. I called Al March, another trainer uh, who I helped get started. And he said, come over, check out my new dog. And he met me over at the PetSmart store. And uh, we took her in there. I need to get a couple things, like a new bowl and stuff. And uh, she, she was so honored. She was trying to bite the steel, you know, the shelving and everything. I mean, God, she was a nut. Wow. And so I stayed there. At, I was still working at PetSmart there part-time. And uh, I stayed in that parking lot till 10 that night, getting her squared away. She went on to a very long career helping children. Uh, learn about dogs, and I could take her into schools and have kindergartners swarm her and everything else. So, but she was stone psycho. After we got that understanding, once I figured out what she was about, and I figured it out that she was, uh, she had been treated as a Doberman, like, uh, think about a military working dog or something. They treated her like that. You know, these were cops, uh, and, you know, the type. Yep. But I always tell people she wasn't a Doberman. She was a Doberman. And once she knew she didn't have to be ornery and she wouldn't be pushed to the point where she felt she had to kill everything, one of the best dogs I ever had. So wow. is she She turned me into a Doberman person, and then uh, I lost her. I wouldn't say suddenly. She was getting up there, but then her heart went, like, rather quickly. This other customer I was working had this one that was chewing up the family and beating up the wife. I got her. That's Raven, the one you met. Yep. And you could see she was real aggressive, wasn't she? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She, but you, you know how she is? That's what I'm talking about, Psycho. She's just fun, you know what I mean? She's a party girl, and uh, she's fast, and she's smart, and she's responsive. So I'm a Doberman guy now, I guess. I kept telling Serena, I said, uh, Raven is a mover. Like, she's yes, she's she just a, a mover. That's all. She, she is a, I tell everybody, she is a Malinois in a Doberman coat. <laughs> she, you know, she's busy like that. Like, she yeah. never, I have to tell her to calm down, and she will very nicely, and she'll rest, And but I have to tell her to. <laughs> <Yeah. So, laughs> but I love her to death, man. I, you know, she's she's my girl. We, we've been on a lot of travels together. But she, she sells a lot of dog training. I bet. I um, bet. It's always good to have that uh, role model of a dog. <laughs> Well, when I make her go get the tools of the trade and she brings them up there and we're ready to go to work, man, that thing they sold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, George, thank you so much for uh, coming on. I, you were definitely on my mind when I first started doing this podcast, and I'm, I'm glad we were able to finally connect and make it happen. Well, I love talking to you. I'm one of those guys. I can talk to you for hours on end if you want. I got opinions. They're not always popular or, or right, but I definitely have them. I think to anybody out there, if you haven't met George or if you haven't had the opportunity to sit down and talk with him, you're not going to forget it. I love your, I don't know, I come away from our conversations very grounded, I guess you could say, it tends to put things into perspective. I just feel like no matter what you say, I, I can look back on, yeah, I could have done that with that dog or yeah, I should have done that with that dog. I, there's just that advice that is so valuable to be able to, to take and run with. So, um, well, I'm glad. it's free for the taking, man. You know what I mean? I don't charge anybody for it. I mean, I do seminars, but can some, you know, I got to pay travel time, but yeah, I'd go up there. If someone had enough cold beer and enough fire and enough night, man, we could <laughs> talk all night. You know what I mean? Yeah, and those times sitting around the fire talking dogs are probably some of the best. And that's in my opinion. That's that's the uh, even at the conferences, 
the, the, the gold is in the after hours mingling. Love the conferences and all, but I love getting together with people and hearing their stories and helping them if I can. And I get a lot of help from them sometimes, too. You know, I'm not afraid to learn something. Sure. So, mm-hmm. Sure. Absolutely. And if you're interested in becoming a dog trainer, uh, George's place is hiring. <laughs> yeah. And listen, um, that's true. I mean, if you're if you really I, I want team members, I'm looking for people going to be with me for 20 years. I'm not looking for someone who wants to learn for a couple of weeks and then see you later. It's not that uh, nothing wrong with shadowing and stuff. But that's not what I'm yep. looking for. I want people I can mold, shape and make successful and have them be 40 years in someday. Yep. Awesome. Well, George, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, I, I truly appreciate your wisdom and your experience and your stories. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I don't know if anybody wants to listen, but there you go. Thank you very much, George. All right. Take care. Hey, guys. I'm really happy to announce my first shadow program for 2018. I'll be offering it from Monday, June 4th to Friday, June 8th. And there are only five spots available. This is going to be so much fun. I'm so excited to be able to offer this to you guys. The week is going to pretty much include everything that I do on a daily basis, from working with the training dogs, handling large groups of daycare and boarding dogs, some marketing ideas if you need a little help with that. You will also be a part of our Wednesday night socials, which are always a big hit with our clientele and our staff, and also our weekly training classes, too, in the evening, our our traditional six-week course. So you truly will be immersed into the day-to-day operations of how we Uh, manage things here, manage the dog. And I think I'm also going to be doing a roundtable podcast at the end of the week to kind of wrap everything up. So this should be a lot of fun. If you're interested, you guys just message me on our Facebook page, Vermont Dog Trainer, and I will be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Hope to see you this June.